Hey everybody, it's time for another wrap up. I have a stack of books sitting beside me that I cannot wait to tell you about. So let's get started. Hi everybody and welcome back to my channel. It's Russell with Ink and Paper Blog. How are you all doing? As always, I hope you guys are safe. I hope you guys are healthy. I hope reading is going well. I hope your families are safe and healthy and I hope they're reading as well. Let's just be honest. It's still very, very warm here in Northern California so there's not much to do outside. Uh, we walk the dogs. There's not really much to do outside anyways. Um, I will say that my friend Ryan and I did do our first bookstore adventure this weekend where we went and actually shopped in a bookstore, which was nice. The bookstore was lovely. The people I knew there were great. Um, however, there were a lot of people out and about with no sort of sense of social distancing or masks. So that made me very, very nervous. So I haven't left my house since. <laughs> so I am back. I am back inside and I am happy to stay here for a little bit longer and see how everything works out. But I hope everyone is definitely, definitely healthy and reading and enjoying it. So today I am here to do a wrap up. So this is going to be an interesting wrap up because as you guys know, I usually only read books that I really enjoy and I tend to do fairly favorable reviews. But at the end of this, we are going to actually get a review from me that is not favorable. So if you've been waiting, if you've been waiting for Russell to talk about a book in a not positive manner, this is the wrap up for you. But before we even get there, there are a lot of books that I want to tell you about that are actually very, very good. So get out your pen, get out your paper, get out your Goodreads, get out however you keep track of your TBR. If you're able to start supporting your local independent bookstores, please do so. You know they still need us more than ever right now. If you're a library user, I know some libraries are sort of back and open and some are still digital. I hope you're able to get the books that way or have your libraries pre-order them or order them for you. All of these books are out so you can get them all. So let's get started. The first book I'm going to tell you about is Pizza Girl by Jean Kyung Frazier. This is out now from Doubleday, and it actually came out this month, so it will also be in my June release video that is coming. Um, but this is a fantastic book. This is the story of a young, unnamed narrator girl. She's young. She's just out of high school, and her and her high school boyfriend um, have... Uh, her and her. They have not. She has become pregnant, but he is a very supportive young man, and he has moved in and wants to take care of her and sort of has ideas of how their life are going to be. Um, unfortunately for her, her father has just passed away, and she's still dealing with sort of the the, the loss in that she just really hasn't sat down and taken stock of what the loss of her father means to her. She also hasn't really recognized how much she is like her father, who tend to be rather seclusive and a bit of an alcoholic. And she deals with sort of this throughout the book in many different fascinating ways. But what she has done is she has started working at a pizza delivery place. And one of the people that she winds up delivering to is a woman named Jen. And Jenny has just moved to town with her family from Nebraska. And she has moved to town and she calls in and she orders a pizza with pickles on it because she's having trouble getting her son acclimated to the city. And they don't normally serve pickles on pizza, but our narrator goes out of her way, delivers it, and then winds up becoming obsessed with Jenny and her life. And they wind up sort of intertwining lives in a couple of different ways. There's clearly this pizza interaction piece, but there's also this, this group for mothers that Jenny convinces our narrator to go to. And in doing so, they sort of create this weird sort of codependent relationship. Now, there's not a ton of plot to this book in the sense that there's not a like this huge sort of adventure. This is very much about being in the mind of this young girl as she's sort of coming to terms with what her life is. She has a lot of potential, but she's not doing much with it because she really hasn't dealt with her father's death and she doesn't know what she wants to do with the pregnancy, her boyfriend who is very supportive, but sort of in almost a saccharine way, and her mother, who is also supportive, but also maybe doesn't quite recognize how her daughter has been affected by what's happened. And to me, this sort of had vibes of 
I don't want to say, yeah, sort of vibes of like um, perks of being a wallflower, sort of that idea of a person interacting with others as they sort of come to self realizations about who they are and who they're going to be. Um, this is a debut novel. It is packed full with talent and really exciting to figure out what Jean um, Kyung Fraser is going to do next. I really love this book. It made me think the ending's a little bit sort of wild, which I enjoyed because it added a complexity to the main character. Um, there's a lot in this book that I just found really intriguing, and I was just, I left it wanting to know what Jean um, Kyung Fraser was going to do next. So that was a lot. I hope that uh, was enough to get you guys to pick up this book. But this is Pizza Girl by Jean, Jean Kyung Fraser out now from Doubleday. Highly recommend it. I think it's out now. Yes, it came out on June 9th. Highly recommend. Okay. From my friends over at Two Line Press, we have this beautiful, beautiful book. And this is Echo on the Bay by Matsugu. Oh no, translated from the Japanese by Angus Turnvell. Now, I read um, the first book that Two Lines Press published from this author translator pair, and it was called, oh my goodness, it's not, The Lion Cross Point, um, which I absolutely loved. And that book actually is a beautiful hardback copy. I um, highly recommend it too. Echo on the Bay is the story of a young girl who her father is a policeman, and he winds up getting transferred to this tiny town on the water in Japan that has sort of like this gossipy neighborhood feel to it. And she becomes sort of an observer of the different characters within the community. There's also some big events that go on. Um, I don't want to give them away because I think they add to sort of the suspense of this book. But in a way, this is a quiet novel about a town and the people who live in it and make up the composition of that that community and one young girl's observations as they come into contact with her father who is sort of representing authority and he to be honest does not always do a great job of being an authoritarian type figure um the mother character in this is fantastic sort of has this sort of dry wit to her also at times we'll just point things out she is no nonsense but it just had such a lovely community feel to it even when things got a little bit more complicated there's also this theme about this this boat that disappeared years ago that has now wind up back on shore. Again, it's one of those books where not a lot happens, but I don't want to tell you the little things because all of those pieces of the puzzle, when they come together, make it a very satisfying read. Um, I really love this book. And I have to say, Angus Turnville, as a translator, does a great job of adding a poetic nature. I'm sure there's a poetic nature to the actual text itself, but he makes it very poetic in English. My only thing with the book, there was a couple of times where there were some characters where the names got a little bit too similar and I got a little confused and I had to go back and reread, but I think that's that can happen sometimes when you're meeting an entire community of people. Um, but yeah, I highly, highly recommend this book. And so this is Echo on the Bay by Masses... You know, I practice and practiced Masasugu Ono, translated from the Japanese by Angus Turnville. I'm so sorry, Mr. Ono. Um, and this is out now from Two Line Press. Read both of the books. Trust me, you will not be disappointed. They're both very, very good. And I kind of feel like I just want to... There's a blurb on here from Yoko Tawada, who won the National Book Award Translation Prize the first year it came out a couple years ago. Um, yeah, so highly, highly recommend. Highly recommend. Okay, now we're going into a book that's like totally different and such one of those blockbuster, bestseller books. Um, that everyone's probably talked about, and you're just going to get my very, very brief opinion on this. And that is The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins. This is a Hunger Games novel, and this is a prequel to the books that we have already read. And this is about President Snow. If you guys have read the three books or seen the movies, you know who President Snow is. He um, is clearly the villain of the first three books. So this is the story of sort 
of how he got to where he was. And we start at the 10th Hunger Games, I believe, and a new thing has occurred where students in this in the school are going to mentor the children that have cho been chosen um, as um, tributes for the Hunger Games. Now, there's a couple things I want to say about this. Susan Collins brought me right back into the Hunger Games. In pages, I was there. I was bought in. The characters were great. The story, everything about that world was built right there for me. It seems weird to have a book where President Snow, who is so evil in the Hunger Games novel, now becomes our main character. However, I firmly believe that Susan Collins could not have made another book where we had a young heroine from the districts. She needed to flip the script. She needed to flip it on its head. And what I will say is she never makes Snow completely likable. Gosh, my eye is itching. Hold on one second. Sorry about that. There, He's a very complicated character. At times you feel yourself cheering for him and then he does something and you're like, oh, that's right, this man is not always a good person. Um, and there's a lot of decisions he makes that are completely in line with his characters in the future, his character in the future. Um, there are great characters in this book, and she does a great job also of building a history we already known, making parts of it seem new and interesting and dynamic. Um, here's the thing, this is a weird book to come out right now because do we really want a book about adults who put children together to kill each other? It's extremely morbid in a way that that is what's going on in this book in this time period. So I could feel that people could be uncomfortable with the subject matter right now. But I will say, as a book in and of itself, I enjoyed the story. I was bought in. I like a complicated character. I know that in the end, I hate this man. But I want to know why he became the man I hated, if that makes sense. And the story is driving. The plot is great. The sort of tricks and the and all of that are fantastically done. So I really enjoyed this. But I could understand having problems with it right now. But to me, it made sense as where she would go next. And she did a nice job of telling the story. So I give it a huge thumbs up, but I can understand if it's not the right book right now. So that's The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Susan Collins out from Scholactic, Scholactic Press. And this is the first book in a new trilogy that she is putting out. And I'm interested. I'm very, very interested. And I feel like I have this weird hair just sticking in my eyeball. Sorry, guys. Next is a book that is very likely going to be in my top five reads of the year, and that is The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. This is out now from Riverhead Books. Um, this is, again, my Book of the Month Club copy. This is the story of two sisters. We have Stella and Desiree. They live in a community in Louisiana where most of the people, um, it is a black community, but most of the people have very, very light skin and a lot of them can pass as white people. And this is the dynamic of these two sisters who decide to run away from home. They go to New Orleans and then one sister disappears. Um, that's Stella. Stella disappears. And Desiree is sort of in New Orleans by herself now, and she has to come to terms of what she's going to do. She winds up getting married. She winds up having a daughter. And that daughter, she winds up marrying a darker-skinned Black man, and her daughter comes out with very, very dark skin. And her husband is abusive, so she returns home. And it starts another dynamic within that town. There's a lot of discussion in this book about race within race. There's also discussion about in this book about being sort of proud of who you are and where you come from, or deciding to start all over and tell a lie. And then once you tell that lie, Stella tells a lie, she winds up actually moving away and passing for white for most of her life. And once she tells that lie, the inability to sort of come back from it. What happens is we get involved in the lives of these women and their children. And there's uh, different narrators. Uh, Desiree's daughter has sections. And she winds up moving to Los Angeles to go to UCLA, where uh, 
Um, she winds up falling out in love um, and having a relationship with a trans man and that dynamic in that relationship. Um, I want to talk about that in just a second. And then there's sort of the way that all of the families come back together. I will say that there is a little bit of that literature coincidence that occurs where two things that maybe probably couldn't happen, happen. It adds to the story. It gets us where we're going. Um, but Desiree and Stella, by the end of the book, are so well thought out. And they're so dynamic and so multidimensional that it becomes a lot of fun to revel in the brilliance. I'm, I realize I have this down here. Revel in the brilliance of Britt Bennett. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Britt's handling of a trans male character. Um, I was surprised. I didn't see it coming. And I want to say she does it beautifully. She's so respectful to the whole entire experience of the character. She is never judging to the character. She never does anything but allow that character to live the most authentic life. And I will say that when you juxtapose the trans character, and I apologize, I cannot remember his name for the life of me right now. In if you take his life and transpose it or juxtapose it with Stella, who is told this lie in order to have a different life and where he is telling his authentic self to the world, it's a very interesting conversation. And both of the characters are so well thought out and developed that you get these different perspectives of identity and self, not only racially, but sexually, orientation-wise, gender-wise. And it's beautifully done. And it's just such a good book. And it has a very satisfying ending. And it's just one of those things where you, if you let yourself be put in the hands of Britt Bennett, she will take good care of you. She will tell you a story. She will meet, let you meet characters and she'll make you realize how talented she is. And by the end of this book, you will be happy you read it, I promise. So that is The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. I think it is utterly brilliant. If you haven't read her debut, The Mothers, I highly recommend that as well. It's very, very good. Um, and, but I do, I will say that this is better. This is better. This is a masterpiece. The Vanishing Half, Riff Bennett. Love it, love it, love it. Okay, I know some of you have been waiting just for this moment because you're like, Russell never pans a book. Russell never tells you not to read something. And that is very true. I very rarely will do this to myself. I don't like to be negative. I don't like to be, that's just not who I am as a person. And it's not who I am as a reader. But we're going to have some honest discussions about this book right now. And that is The Bright Lands by John Fram. This comes out July 7th from Hanover uh, Square Press. Yeah, Hanover Square Press. Um, and I have to thank them. They did send me a copy. The premise of this book, when I read about it, was fascinating. So this is the story of a gay adult male in New York City who receives a phone call from his younger brother in a small town in Texas that indicates that his brother is struggling. So he returns home to try to help his brother. And very soon at the beginning of the book, his brother is killed and a mystery, a, an investigation into the murder of his brother occurs. And in that, in the blurb sort of thing, the investigation is there are gonna be secrets in this little tiny town and everything's gonna come out and all of that. I love everything about that, okay? I love everything about that. Um, the book is told in multiple different perspectives from some of the high school kids that knew his brother, from his perspective, from his ex-high school girlfriend who um, he left there and she is now a police officer. I will say it comes out very early. He was forced, to, not forced to leave, but um, there was a huge scandal with him getting caught being a gay boy in the town that caused all sorts of issues for his family and for himself. The town is your quintessential Texas small town, lots of homophobia, um, rampant on the, on, on, the, on the surface. Okay? 
And then what happens is as this sort of gets investigated, you find out that there's all these weird things about the football team. There's this place called the Brightlands where people talk about going, but it causes sort of these psychological issues. Um, and then for some reason, we find out that a lot of the people are having trouble sleeping and they're having these dreams, okay? This is where this book goes all awry. One, John Fram decides to take the trope of the closeted gay homosexual. <laughs> gay and homosexual are the same thing. I realize that. It just came out. Uh, gay men in a small town and amp it up. He like turns it to 10. And unfortunately, in doing so, sucks the believability of that out of his book. Um, it, it was interesting in an idea if there was sort of this dynamic of, you know, some of the people having closeted issues or having, you know, sort of these secrets. But when he did it so much, it became annoying. In addition, there's an additional sort of supernatural element to this book, which I'm not going to give away because this may speak to some of you, that comes out of, of nowhere and was so far-fetched and so obnoxious and so unbelievable. Like, I get it. Like, supernatural things are rarely believable in sort of a, a factual sense. But it, it's not like, you know, the... Um, you know, it's not like Stranger Things where you can sort of see how it all comes together. This is just shoved in there. It's like John Fram decided, hey, I'm going to take all these things I like and everything I've ever read in a Stephen King novel and I'm going to shove it into a book and it's going to be one book and it's going to make no sense. All of his characters are so one dimensional. It makes n none of their decision making, none of the reasons that anything are done really becomes evidently part of who they are. It's just so trite that by the end of it, I was, I was so upset <laughs> by the time I finished this book. It, it, it just does not work for me. I can't even recommend this on any sort of sense or scale. I like John Fram. I follow him on Twitter. I follow him on Instagram. I think he has a great personality. He calls himself Seething Queen, which I think is clever and funny. Um, but this book was so frustrating to me and just plain awful. And I don't use that word very often, you guys. You know that. So I can't recommend The Bright Lands by John Fram out on July 7th from Hanover Square Press. I'm sorry. I really, really wanted to like this book. It just did not work for me. So there you go. You guys cannot say that there hasn't been a time where I have really gone after a book on the channel. And that's probably even a little bit nice for how some people are. I watch some people and I'm like, I don't think I can ever be that mean. So know that that was probably as mean as I'm ever going to get when reviewing a book. As always, if you are a new subscriber, thank you so much for coming by. I hope you stay around. If you are a return subscriber, you know I could not do this without you. So I thank you so very, very much. As always, I encourage you to shop locally, read globally. And until next time, I wish you happy reading. Bye.